and welcome back to Pass the Torque. I'm your host, Katie Codry. This season, we'll be delving into a slew of topics from International Space Station to robotics to Artemis. This week, however, we're kicking off the season with retired astronaut Scott Altman, also known as Scooter. Scooter's here to tell you about his experiences as an astronaut and more. While you're listening to his presentation, feel free to drop questions in the comments below, and he'll try and get back to you. Without further ado, I'll pass it to Scooter. Can you give us a brief overview of your Hubble servicing experience? Well, uh, I ended up commanding the final two Hubble servicing missions. Uh, Hubble was designed to be serviced by astronauts, so it had been serviced. And, of course, that was the miracle of Hubble from the beginning when they found out that the mirror had been ground just slightly wrong uh, with a spherical aberration, and they were able to service and repair its focus. But the thing that happened after that is that we were able to upgrade the telescope fix things that went wrong, and also then add new technology as it was being developed into the telescope. So that in the end, it's not a 30-year-old telescope, it's about a 10-year-old telescope right now with uh, new systems and updated technology. Uh, and it was just a real thrill of me to be involved. With Hubble is an incredible scientific instrument. It's uh, revolutionized our understanding of the universe and also brought a whole bunch of questions that show our lack of understanding of the universe. So. Uh, uh, I was very honored to be a part of a team that serviced Hubble. So I spent uh, 15 years at NASA, arriving in 1995 with Group 15, and then uh, departing in 2010. Uh, NASA actually, I always wondered when I'd know if it was time to leave NASA, and NASA made it easy for me because uh, when we retired the space shuttle, because of my sitting height, I don't fit in the Russian uh, Soyuz. So I didn't have a ride to orbit anymore. Uh, I thought, well, if I want to fly, uh, continue to do things, I need to, to go on and try industry. So I've been out doing that for the last 10 years. That uh, sitting height has kind of impacted me off and on over my career, uh, with the latest being the fact that I don't fit in the Soyuz. How did you feel the first time you experienced zero gravity in space? You know, zero gravity in space is a very unique experience. You can... Uh, get exposed to it in short little uh, periods, flying on an airplane where you go into zero G, uh, you can fly upside down, that's negative one G, not zero G. But uh, getting up there, and you think you're trained for it and ready, but your inner ear just kind of throws up the towel and goes, what the heck is going on? This is crazy. You turn your head, anytime you turn your head, which is normally finely designed to keep your sense of balance so that you can look and point at something even though your head's moving and now your inner ear is feeling all these different sensations and it just says whoa uh, so when you first get there it's nice to kind of take your time move slow and then eventually you start to become adapted it took me about four hours and then i felt like i'd been there my whole life uh, but that the launch sequence is really neat too because you're being slammed back in your seat at three G's, just compressed. Imagine, you know, you're lying on the floor and two of your friends the same size as you jump on your chest. That's three G's. And all of a sudden, that main engine cutoff, just like that, you're zero G and you're floating. And you, I tell people it felt like going over a hill on a roller coaster where you feel your stomach kind of rise up inside. And I kept waiting for it to go back down, but it, it didn't for 16 days on that first flight. What's the difference between flying a jet in Top Gun and landing the space shuttle? <laughs> uh, well, they're both great things to do, I'll tell you that. I thoroughly enjoyed them both. Very different in many ways. Uh, flying a jet in Top Gun, where we did a lot of maneuvers down low, you know, getting to buzz the tower, uh, simulating Cougar's landing on the ship, aerial combat maneuvering, a very visceral, very intense feeling, you know, you're pulling a lot of G's, you're, uh, you know, grunting and groaning as you're doing that, trying to stay conscious, uh, and it, it, but exhilarating at the same time. And then uh, flying the space shuttle, there are a couple of times, you know, a lot of the shuttle is uh, computerized and controlled by the, the system. On launch, we're mostly monitoring and waiting to take over if something goes wrong. But there are two times where the commander actually hand flies the vehicle. 
One is on rendezvous as you're getting close to Hubble, in my case, or the space station on my second flight. And then the other time is on landing. Because once you come in and you go subsonic, it's the uh, commander on the controls who actually lands the vehicle. And the thing that makes landing a little more intense than maybe even landing on an aircraft carrier on a dark and stormy night is that you know from the moment you burn your engines something like 12,000 miles away from touchdown, the one thing that's for sure is we are going to hit the ground. And you want to have a runway underneath you when you get there. So uh, that adds a little bit of extra stress. On all my approaches in the Navy, I knew if something went wrong, I took my left hand, ran the throttles up, and we tried again. Uh, in the shuttle, there's only one chance. And on rendezvous, that's exactly opposite to flying. Because when I'm flying a jet, I'm very tightly controlling, making tiny inputs all the time, constantly like that. In flying a rendezvous, it's more like driving a boat. You want to make an input, wait and see what happens. Is that good? Do I need another one? Okay, yes. Because if you end up trying to fly it like a jet, you end up over controlling and making way too many inputs and too much uh, use up too much fuel. What are some ideal scenarios for astronaut servicing? How about robotic servicing? So I think there's a lot of opportunity in the future for uh, both. Uh, I think Hubble's a great example of an instrument that benefits from both robotics and humans in that it's up there 24 hours a day, you know, complete 365 days a year doing science. And yet astronauts were able to come to it and insert technology. Uh, one of the great things about having people involved is the ability to flex on demand when you run into problems that you didn't uh, foresee. Robotic servicing has a lot of opportunity to do things like refueling on-orbit uh, satellites and maybe uh, boosting them into different orbits with a new propellant pack. And I know Goddard is working on that right now and making some great progress, getting ready to demonstrate that capability on orbit with the space station uh, and a package, in, instrumented package that's gonna go to station. Um, the human part though, again, we planned for our uh, servicing very carefully and we came up with contingency procedures that we would do if something went wrong. And the thing is, we found out on almost every spacewalk, something went wrong in a way we didn't imagine ahead of time. And you had to think on the fly in conjunction with the ground to come up with the best way to go forward and solve those problems. And there were some things that I think would have been very difficult for a robotic servicing mission to have overcome in the end. <laughs> yes, I have plenty of those. Yeah, um, yeah. well, it's our first spacewalk and we have a, a series of tasks and they've all been prioritized and we know that the number one scientific objective is to put this new wide field camera in to Hubble. To do that, you have to take out the old wide field planetary camera with PIC-2. So it has been bolted in there uh, for the last uh, 10 years roughly, and everybody knew that it had been torqued down to about 40 foot pounds. We had a torque wrench that we were gonna put on that because we also knew that if you over torque that boat, bolt taking it out to something like 50 foot pounds, the shaft would shear and the old camera would be stuck in there forever. So first event, we get outside, everything's going fine till Drew Foistel puts the torque wrench on the bolt, dials 40 foot pounds in and nothing happens. The bolt doesn't move. Okay, contingency plan, if it's a little stuck, dial it up. Okay, 45 foot pounds bolt doesn't move. Torque wrench limit that we can set is 48 foot-pounds. Bolt doesn't move. I'm like, great, we're going to be fail on our very first thing with the number one science objective. So the only option that we defaulted to then was putting him out there with a, a wrench on the bolt with basically a breaker bar, just a straight mechanical force, no torque limit. And if he over torqued it, or was too rough with it, the shaft would break and we'd be stuck. But we figured, I guess that's all we have left to try. So uh, we put him out there and I said, okay, Drew, you have a go. And he put there and like, it broke, it broke free. And, like, yeah. and then the, the camera came out and everything was good and my heart rate went back down 
And we were able to actually get through that doing things a little differently than we had planned. Which of your four space flights was your favorite one and why? So uh, I feel a little bit like somebody asking me which one of my three sons is my favorite, that it, it doesn't seem right, but I do have a favorite mission, and that's uh, the last one, the final servicing mission for Hubble, STS-125. Uh, and part of the reason that it's my favorite is stories like the one I just told about problems we had. Every day, we'd run into a problem, and I would think, I'm going to be remembered as the commander of the crew that killed the Hubble Space Telescope, the most incredible scientific instrument of all time. But at the end of all those spacewalks, uh, it turned out we'd figure out a way to get past all the problems that we've had, and we got everything done that was on our plate for that mission. And when we set Hubble adrift again on a voyage of exploration, we had achieved all our objectives, and I was just so proud of the whole team that uh, it's hard to, to imagine that feeling and how great it made me feel uh, that we had done so well together. Because it really was a team effort between us in space and the folks on the ground that overcame all these obstacles. How have the Hubble Space Telescope and the servicing missions helped humanity? Well, Hubble, uh, first of all, the servicing missions made Hubble a, you know, a functioning telescope and kept increasing its exploration power. The amazing thing is there are more scientific papers being written now using Hubble than ever. And uh, we've inserted the technology that even though it was more than 10 years ago, still doing some incredible observations. I'm really excited about getting James Webb on orbit, but it's not a replacement for Hubble. It's kind of in a different wavelength. So it's, it would be great to have two incredible telescopes going at the same time, uh, expanding our ability to discover. Hubble is an amazing time machine to me. When you look at the light it collects, some of it's been traveling across the universe for 13 billion years. And you can look at galaxies at different distances and say, okay, that was 6 billion years ago. This is 2 billion years ago. And there are even, uh, you know, closer galaxies that are only hundreds of light years away. Um, but it really has expanded our knowledge of the universe Although it also gave rise to things like dark matter and dark energy. Um, on one of my, before my first Hubble servicing mission, we were talking to the folks at Goddard who were using the telescope and researching dark matter and dark energy. And uh, some of my crewmates who, MSs who had PhDs were like, wait, this doesn't make sense. And they were having a hard time wrapping their mind around dark matter and dark energy until the scientists just said, you know what? I can't explain it anymore. You guys do your job and I'll do mine. Well, that made one of my crew members really mad because he said, what do you mean? So anyway, we went up, we flew, we came back and he was waiting to go back to the science and say, okay, we did our job, now you do yours. And the rest of the story is that the scientist then did his job and won a Nobel Prize for work based on the Hubble telescope uh, after the servicing mission that we'd done. So. Everybody achieved on that one. What is your favorite memory of space or story about your time as an astronaut? Any practical jokes played on fellow crew members? Well, I think you already, uh, you already got my story about my favorite time or the, the thing that I remember. Although there are a lot of moments that are memorable from being in space. One that I share with people sometimes is how I got a new appreciation for the planet. Uh, just when you get to orbit and you look at the curvature of the Earth, there's this little thin blue line right at the edge uh, of the horizon. And I realized that's the atmosphere. And that's as it, it doesn't seem very thick at all compared to you know, what we need here to live and breathe. And it made the planet seem kind of delicate to me. Then flying over Africa at night, I'm looking down, I see thunderstorms going with lightning popping off. And you see a flash over here and a little string of lightning and then another flash over there. And you just felt this rhythm like the planet was breathing underneath us as I watched this experience. And just 
it's a spaceship Earth. It's a great place, uh, my favorite planet. So I love that. And you talk about practical jokes, there's maybe a couple. Before my first flight, you do a lot of food testing because you have to plan your uh, menu and you get to pick different things that you like or don't like. One of the things on the menu that I tasted ahead of time was called eggplant surprise. And uh, I'm not a big eggplant eater. And when I tasted that, it was not my favorite. And I didn't put it on my list. But my commander thought it would be funny if I got to orbit. And one day I opened up my drawer and looked at my menu and it was eggplant surprise for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So he played that joke on me. I got there and saw that. Fortunately, there's enough extra food in other places that I was able to survive and get through that day. How did you become an astronaut? Do you have any advice for people who want to follow in your footsteps? Well, my uh, story on becoming an astronaut is a little different than some folks. Uh, I started out when I was three years old wanting to be a pilot. And it was that pursuit that took me through the whole Air Force uh, story I went through, then with the Navy. And as a Navy fighter pilot, I thought, well, now I want to be a test pilot. So I applied for and went to test pilot school. And while I was at test pilot school, right near the end, we took a field trip. And one of the places we went was Houston. And I met astronauts and I realized two things. One, astronauts are actually real people. I don't think I believed that before growing up. It seemed like it was a different category of human. And some of them had careers a lot like mine had been before they became astronauts. The second thing I realized is this is really cool. I want to do this. So uh, I went back uh, to the test center, graduated from test pilot school, applied when they had a call for applications, actually got called down for an interview, went all the way through the process till I got the phone call and they said, no, you can't be an astronaut. So, uh, I went back to the Navy, took the F-14D on its first operational cruise, and NASA called again for interviews. I went, uh, actually left the ship from the Persian Gulf and flew back to Houston. And then uh, at the end of the selection process this time, they said yes, and I joined NASA in uh, February of 1995. What should people do to increase their chances of becoming an astronaut? I tell them the same thing I tell folks about going after your dreams. You know. Follow your dreams. And if your dream is becoming an astronaut or anything else, what do you need to do? Well, work hard. Find out as much as you can about whatever it is. And for students, younger kids, I say, look around, uh, cast a wide net, because you'll find something that is really interesting to you. And when you're going after trying to learn things about stuff that you really resonate with, it's easy to want to become the best and to learn as much as you can. The second thing, you know, is to work hard, do the homework that it takes to do that. And the final thing, really, is don't give up. Life is going to throw you curves. People are going to say no. They said no to me several times. But if you keep going after things, uh, you'll be surprised at where you can end up. You don't always end up where you thought you might want to, like I didn't up, end up as an Air Force pilot, but got saved to become a Navy pilot. Uh, but. Uh, You'll find some interesting place, and if you found that thing that resonates with you, no matter what happens, you'll be happy and fulfilled, I think, in uh, pursuing that goal. So follow your dreams is my advice to folks. I always enjoyed math and physics, but the things that I really loved were reading and history. Uh, so when I was a freshman in college, I took a course on world history, and my advisor, a professor, actually pulled me in and said, hey, I think you have a real talent for history. Your essays were nice and all this. Uh, you should become a history major and eventually you could maybe become a professor or something like that. I said, well, that sounds great, but I want to fly. And I'm better off uh, becoming an engineer to become a pilot than I would be a historian. But it's a piece of my life that I've always been interested in. I, I still spend time reading. Uh, history books and, and learning about the past uh, and really enjoy that. What upcoming NASA mission are you most excited about and why? That's a, a tough one because there's so much going on right now that's so exciting. It seemed like for a long time the next great thing was just over the horizon, but now it's here. 
SpaceX launch, uh, Boeing Starliner is coming right behind it, Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser. I think those are all incredibly exciting that we're getting U.S. launch capability back to Florida. Uh, but if you want to ask what I'm really excited about, it's Orion and Artemis and going back to the moon and setting the stage for a trip with humans to Mars in my lifetime. And I really believe we can do it. Thanks so much, Scooter. Now it's your turn to ask some questions. Go ahead and drop any questions you have for Scooter in the comments below. He'll be logging in on Friday to answer as many as he can. We've got a great season set up for you, so make sure you turn in again next week to learn more about what we do here at NASA. See you then. So you can see the stuff on the wall behind me. I mean, this is from STS-125. This is actually launched from STS-106, which is what that picture is, uh, with Terry Wolcott. And we had two Russians on board with me on that one. This is my going away photo from uh, the F-14D when I got selected to be an astronaut. And uh, you might notice there's gold stars next to everybody's signature. And that's because I told them the story a long time ago about how when I was a little kid, and I told my parents I wanted to be a pilot. They said, you can do anything you want as you, long as you do your best. And at the same time, I was going through uh, toilet training. And they came up with a, uh, a system that said, every time, Scott, that you complete your mission successfully, we'll put a gold star up on a chart. And when you get 25 gold stars, you can pick between an airplane ride or a new pair of cowboy boots. And uh, I eventually achieved that success, and I picked the airplane ride. And my mom says, I always wondered what would have happened if you'd picked the cowboy boots. So there's that story. I, I could have been a cowboy. Yeah, I, I said, this is that picture of me and Nancy that I told you about uh, with her next to me, and same size. Me, this is one you'll probably find, me on the servicing the Lyo canisters on 125. And flying the T-38 back to my hometown.